Good morning. My name is Perry Eddy, and I'm with the Trade and Investment Team here at Edmonton Global. We are coming to you from the Agri-Food Discovery Place on the University of Alberta campus in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Edmonton Global is a not-for-profit investment attraction agency that represents the 15 municipalities that comprise the Edmonton metropolitan region. We have a deep agricultural roots that reach way back. Our region includes more than 1.7 million acres of high quality agricultural land. Thank you for joining us. We have gathered a group of research and industry experts to discuss global dynamics that have made the Edmonton region the ideal location for fractionation. And for those interested in exploring protein fractionation in Western Canada, Edmonton Global is here to guide you through that process. Before we start, I would like to express our sincere thanks to the partners at Invest in Canada and Global Affairs Canada. The Trade Commissioner Service has been integral in reaching out to audiences in market around the world. Likewise, Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada, Invest Alberta Corporation, Alberta Department of Agriculture and Forestry, Plant Protein Alliance of Alberta and Pulse Canada have been so supportive in helping to promote this event. Let's get started. Many may not know that Canada is the largest exporter of pulse crops in the world, and there's a ton of opportunity in fractionation. So, to discuss global trends and local capacity, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Mr. Carlo Dade. Carlo is Director of the Trade and Investment Centre at Canada West Foundation a think tank focused on increasing the growth and profitability in Western Canada's export economy. Carlo, thank you for joining us. Here you go. Thank you. In a recent report, Sprouted, thank you very much. <laughs> Just so happy, I'd, I'd, I'd never leave home without a copy. <laughs> um, you wrote, plant ingredients present the type of opportunity that comes once in a generation. What's that opportunity? Well, that's a reference to Western Canada and the history of the West. You know, several were a commodity producer, but rarely do we have opportunities where it makes economic sense to process those commodities on the prairies. Uh, crude oil, you're not going to process crude oil uh, far from market. Each market has different requirements for gasoline, so you want to process close to markets. You're not going to bake bread on the prairies and ship it all the way to Toronto. You're gonna to ship and mill and, you're gonna mill but ship and bake closer. But with ingredients and fractionation, it makes sense to do the processing here. It doesn't make sense to ship the bulk commodity out, fractionate it, have to deal with the byproducts. You can actually do that close to source. It makes more sense for the processing company too to be closer to source, supply chain, logistics, interruptions, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an opportunity that we've been waiting for for, for a lifetime in the West, something where it makes sense to do processing closer to home. Excellent. With respect to export, can you, can you discuss access to market and specifically, I mean, uh, ease of doing business in other countries, but also the access to get our products into foreign and domestic markets physically? Sure, well the easiest way to think about that, the one that's I think most approachable are tariffs. So you look at the trade agreements that we have. We have an agreement with North America, uh, with the United States. Tariffs were low, so it's really more about market certainty and, and the other benefits of an agreement. But with the agreement around the Pacific Rim, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, we were looking at a something like 1.5% a year cut in the tariff for protein products, uh, plant protein products, to Japan. Uh, the Americans just caught up to us, but for a few years, we had a real advantage. In Europe, uh, the tariff, uh, the World Trade Organization tariff for protein ingredients is like about 12%. We come in at zero. So those are significant advantages in terms of attracting investment. Um, and being able to move products. And then you have the phytosanitary stuff too and the agreements that makes safety protocols and things easier. So a lot of advantages there for us. And I guess uh, agreements like the TCP, uh, TCCPP 
Uh, one with, uh, with Asia, as well as the, uh, the KUZMA or USMCA. The new NAFTA. The new NAFTA. Uh, those agreements also help uh, access other markets. I mean, yeah. we, have, we have a highway that goes right, the, the Canamex Highway goes right from Alberta straight through to, to Mexico. Um, and the rail lines that go through Edmonton as well, we have two class one rail, railroads. So Exactly, yeah, there's the treaty infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, and the cultural and human infrastructure that makes these markets more accessible to us than to some others. So you've talked about the potential in the region. We have international companies and investors tuning in right now. Um, tell us about the range of resources available. So this is really one of the great selling points. It's not just Edmonton, it's Western Canada. If you're an investor, you may not know Edmonton, or you may look at uh, the resources that we have at U of A, and you're comparing those to US states that have a wide range of resources, the state universities, land grant universities, et cetera. But what we're really selling up here is access to everything that's across the West. We have great research centers in Manitoba that are within striking distance of Edmonton. Saskatoon has 19. So when you put the full range of the reasons, region's resources on the table and investors realize that they can move very quickly and easily to access these and that we've linked these through Protein Industries Canada to make access to these, then you're selling a value proposition that's much larger than any one region. We all benefit from sharing. We don't want to compete with each against each other. We want to compete with each other. And when we do that, the proposition for investors is much more powerful. Absolutely. And I guess when it comes to the actual location, the distribution network that's available in the region can really bring those resources to, to any area, including the Edmonton region. Exactly. Investors will sort out. Once we attract them, they can then decide what amongst uh, the resources we have works best. But the trick is to get them to look in the first place. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, Carlo. Uh, we look forward to hearing more from Carlo in the roundtable discussion. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Carlo in the meantime, please enter them into the chat and we'll do our best to get them towards the end of this webinar. Thanks. I'll ask my colleague Amanpreet to share our first poll. We wanted to know which industry sector you represent. Are you a food ingredient processor, a packaged food manufacturer, agricultural commodity producer, government representative, member of a non-government organization, or other? We're just gonna give a few seconds for you to enter these poll options. Okay, let's close the poll. Amanpreet, what are the top two sectors that we have? Uh, it looks like we're close in other and government and food ingredient and processor. Those look like our top three. Okay, excellent. That'll inform our conversation moving forward. Our next panelist is Ken Gosen. Ken is the executive director of the food and bioprocessing branch at Agriculture, sorry, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry and manages the Food Processing Development Center and the AgriValue Business Incubator in Leduc, Alberta. Hello, Ken. Good morning, Welcome Greg. to the webinar. How are you? Great, thanks. Excellent. So, Ken, we are here at the University of Alberta's Agri-Food Discovery Place. It's one of several world-class food and agriculture-focused research centers in the region. And almost next door in Leduc, in the city of Leduc, is another world-class facility, the one you manage, uh, the Food Processing Development Center and the Agri-Food Business Incubator. Can you tell us a little bit about your facility and the role it plays in growing the metropolitan region's value-added food capacity? Great. Well, thanks, uh, Perry. It's great to be here. And yeah, so the Food Processing Development Center and the AgriValue Processing Business Incubator are really one facility. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's 140,000 square feet of federally registered space where we can uh, work with um, any size of company, um, whether it be small um, to medium size to, to multinational companies, where we can do product uh, and process development and uh, where we can also allow companies to produce products for sale. So we can start with an idea and uh, uh, do benchtop work, take it into the pilot plant, do some market testing, 
and then if it's successful, uh, we can put that in, we, companies can move into the incubator, the agri value processing business incubator, and lease space from us, and then really grow uh, their business from there. So it really is a, a one-stop shop where you can uh, get scientific, technical, and uh, just the physical infrastructure to, to grow your business. And, uh, and so it's, it's a really key part of the infrastructure for this, for this region. Um, it's just one of many other players like the University of Alberta, Nate, um, organizations like that, that uh, uh, play a, a key role in, in supporting the value added industry in, 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 in this region. Okay, so Nate, just for those listening in from away, Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. It's one of the, it's the largest polytech in Canada and it's uh, one of our uh, hidden gems. Um, you mentioned um, the companies selling, you know, being able to do business from your facility, mm -hmm. um, and it's federally registered. Does that mean it's uh, Canadian uh, Food Inspection Agency certified? Yes. So, um, so that we do have the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in our facility every day. Okay. And uh, so we are a regulated facility, and so we we can produce products uh, with, under the Safe Food for Canadians, and uh, we can ship anywhere in Canada and internationally as well. Oh, excellent. So your facility just received an influx of funding. Mm -hmm. What impact will that have on new companies coming to the region, especially those interested in plant protein fractionation? Yes, it's a pretty exciting time actually for us. Um, we've got another, we have $25 million to expand our, our incubator, so that'll allow us uh, to lease more suites out to companies. And as well, we've got another uh, $4.3 million project uh, specifically uh, regarding fractionation. So in one of the incubator suites, we have um, fractionation equipment in there and we're installing a brand new spray dryer. And so that will, um, with, the F, with the Food Processing Development Center, we can do bench top and, and small batches. But in the incubator, with that, when that suite is fully um, fitted out, uh, companies can lease that and then um, produce larger volumes to evaluate the market to a larger extent and, and really get a foothold in that in, uh, ingredient space. So that suite you're talking about is a fractionation suite. It's a so, fractionation suite. So yes. it's set up to do scale uh, yes. fractionation of plant proteins. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty exciting opportunity. Absolutely. So tell me about the support you provide to plant protein businesses. If a, if a plant protein business was to come to the region mm -hmm. and say, we want to set up, what kind of support could your organization provide? Yeah, so we, we have quite a, a fulsome suite of services that we can provide to companies. We um, offer uh, product and process development, so we can actually um, take, pr take the ingredients and, and uh, uh, we can fractionate products, fr fractionate the ingredients, and then we can actually uh, develop products with those ingredients. So we do have crop scientists, but we also have bakery scientists, we have meat scientists, and we have dairy scientists. So we can do a variety of different uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, functions with those ingredients. So we can, we can incorporate those ingredients in a number of different uh, food products. Um, and so that's, those are things that, and we also have a sensory program. So we can actually take those products and put them in front of consumers so that you can get um, real life evaluation of your, of your products. So beyond doing the initial um, analysis of their setup and mm -hmm. figuring out how they want to do their fractionation process, mm -hmm. they can also look at further down the value chain on the addition of the, fractionation, or the fractionated product into other end products. Absolutely, it's Excellent. not just about the ingredient, it's also about the food products that you can produce. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, and just a reminder, if uh, you have any questions for Ken, enter them into the chat and we'll get to them during the roundtable discussion. Thanks. Our next panelist is Dr. Dava Vansanthan. Uh, Dr. Vansanthan is a professor of grain processing science and technology in the Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutritional Science at the University of Alberta. He's developed an internationally recognized research program in value-added processing and has a great understanding of innovation that is happening in the Edmonton region when it comes to plant proteins. Hello, Thava. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Perry. So your work at the university has explored processing technology for food ingredients, and your research has been applied directly to address industry challenges. Can you tell us about the expertise and innovation 
uh, that industry can access the University of Alberta and other resources? Yeah. Let me briefly tell about our department first. And this is Agriculture, Food, and Nutritional Science Department. Mm -hmm. And uh, we teach as well as we do research in our uh, university, as like in any other university. And most our, of our teachings and uh, research activities revolve around four major programs in our department. That is uh, food science and bioresource technology. That is where major fractionation related research comes. And also we have human nutrition side, we have plant biosystems and animal science. So you can see that it is all integrated and we function under one facility and this triggers a lot of collaboration between the researchers and scientists. So if you take plant fractionation, especially uh, grains, if you take pulses, pulses are heavily grown in Alberta and we have uh, tons of resources around here. And if you take any grains, there are four major components, uh, protein, carbohydrates, uh, and fats, and minor components. And these are the four major components. But go ahead. So, so which, which uh, component would the, would the uh, fiber? We hear a lot about the fiber as a byproduct of the, right. of the fractionation process. Which, which component would, would fiber fall into? The fiber will fall under carbohydrates. Okay. Um, and uh, coming back to this protein focus, because the protein demand is growing, we all know that, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of small companies and large companies investing in Alberta in different provinces. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the major thing that we do is to, is to see how the main research in our programs, we look at how to extract this protein in a more cost-efficient way. Mm. You know, the, currently the cost of production for these proteins are high, so that the, you know, the future sustainability and other uh, buzzwords going on, replacing animal protein with plant protein in order to ensure sustainability. Mm -hmm. And if you don't produce the protein affordably to the consumers, mm -hmm. the sustainability has no meaning because consumers, all the majority of the population, should be able to afford to purchase that. Then only the shift will occur. Mm -hmm. So our focus here in our program, as well as one of the technologies I founded and uh, founded a company in collaboration with one of my colleagues, um, and this called GrainFrack uh, Inc. And here we focus mainly on that. We developed technologies and partially commercialized or in the near commercial stage, uh, how to reduce the cost of production of protein production. And that also, I assume, goes into reducing resources that are put in as well. You're correct. I mean, in protein production, uh, there are so many stages and steps, and the main part is the water intensive, uh, this is a very water intensive process to go to a very high purity of protein. Mm -hmm. So in our technology, we have reduced the water usage by 40%. It means that it saves a lot of cost in the, in the production. Excellent. So um, you're talking about interdisciplinary research. Right. So some of your research is, is applied research uh, yeah. towards industry right. uh, problems and the other is academic research dealing with, with the actual scientific properties of, of the, of the uh, end products. Yes. So uh, can you discuss that a little bit? Uh, because we have a group of experts here in our department uh, in variety of area in functional characterization of the proteins, for example. And uh, you know, when you extract the protein and the, the applications are diverse in the industry. Industry come with us with questions that, okay, how can I use this protein in this particular application? Right. So first thing, you need diverse functionalities to offer, and then we have to demonstrate that to, uh, to the industry. And uh, in order to do that, the main thing is I'm so blessed to be at the University of Alberta uh, because of the, the, the state-of-the-art facility in terms of uh, equipment facility mm -hmm. for analysis and characterization of these proteins. So is that part of plant, plant uh, material processing? Is that the... Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. It's a holistic processing, you see, we look at. Okay. Um, just 
I was just wondering if, uh, so our audience includes companies from all over the world, uh, probably don't realize everything that's happening in the region. Um, can you tell us some of the exciting things that are happening in plant pre protein <coughs> research at the University of Alberta? Right. Uh, in terms of the plant protein research, uh, the, the technology that I developed is, uh, is, uh, is called air currents assisted particle separation. It's a very uh, simple technology to separate components from grains. Okay. And also, uh, one of my, our colleagues, for example, uh, Dr. Chen is working, she's a protein chemist, and uh, she's looking at uh, uh, nano encapsulation and nanoparticulation of protein uh, uh, material in order to uh, design and, and design delivery systems for nutraceuticals and, and drugs as well. So these are some of the innovative uh, uh, application related research going on in our department. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Theva. You mentioned Grain Frack, and you are also a co-founder yes. of Grain Frack. Um, I'm going to invite your partner, Brad Shapka, to join us uh, to speak a little about Grain Frack and the local business environment. So, Brad is also owner of another company, Sunny Boy Foods, a local food manufacturing company that uses some of the products created from the fractionation process. As mentioned, Brad is also co-founder of Grain Frack. Welcome to the webinar, Brad. Thank you. Okay. Brad, can you give us a brief summary of Grain Frack and its interest in pro plant protein? Sure. So Green Frack is a company that was founded for the purpose of commercializing a technology that was developed by Thava at the University of Alberta. So the technology is called ACAPS, and it's a fractionation technology that up until now we've used largely in relation to beta-glucan production. So a lot of people would know, I think, that beta-glucan is a very uh, effective functional ingredient in terms of reducing cholesterol and for blood sugar normalization. So it has huge implications in the area of healthcare uh, for reducing heart disease and for diabetes. But the big interest that we're seeing right now in the area of fractionation is around the protein. So our technology, as Thava discussed, breaks down a grain or a pulse into various components. And in, the, in terms of protein processing, um, it significantly lowers the cost. So the way our technology works is it reduces the amount or it, it uses far less water than traditional technologies and it uses far less electri uh, electricity and natural gas. So because it's using less water and because it's using less energy, it's more cost effective. The second benefit is that it's more sustainable. So we're um, looking now at how, how we can leverage this new technology in the space of protein processing. So I mentioned earlier that Canada is one of the largest producers of plant protein feedstocks in the world. Can you share what opportunities you see in producing plant proteins regionally? Yeah, I, I just feel so fortunate right now because, um, well, a couple of reasons. I, I live in Canada, and another is you know, I met Thava. Um, we, we have this abundant supply of, of outstanding quality pulses. Most of those pulses are being shipped out on a commodity basis. Um, throughout the world, we're seeing a lot of consumption of plant protein in its very native form. But um, going forward, what we're, we're seeing is a lot of demand for new products that are derived from the ingredients that are isolated. Um, an example is, is what we're seeing with Beyond Meat. You know, that's, uh, um, I have a friend who considers himself to be a very committed flexitarian. And uh, <laughs> so he's, he's, he eats steak most of the time, but every once in a while he eats fava beans because he loves fava beans. He's one of, the, one of the guys that actually likes to eat his plant protein in its very native form. Um, but most of North Americans are looking for products that incorporate plant-based protein as an ingredient. So it might be a, a non-dairy creamer, perhaps, or a Beyond Meat burger. Um, and in, in these cases, the products that, the finished products, the foods that the people are consuming are um, put together from ingredients. And our fractionation technology here in Canada um, enables us to take those commodities and add value to them by converting them and into a, uh, a finished ingredient. So 
as Fabio mentioned earlier, you know, it, it, it is really driven by the, the, by the customer, and in, the customer needs to be able to afford to buy the end product. And uh, I can remember back several years ago, and my hair was less gray, that uh, I tried the, uh, the um, veggie burgers for the first time. Mm -hmm. This was many years ago. And I can tell you that the, uh, the quality of the end product has come a long way, and that is largely due to customer demand. Uh, customers mm -hmm. demanded a non-beef or non-meat um, alternative, and uh, they weren't happy with the with the, the substitute that was available at the time. So it's uh, it's come a long way in terms of the overall product. So I have a question for you: What what's next steps for for Grain Frack? Hmm. So Green Frack's looking for an investment. We, we want to um, create capacity here in, in Canada, in Alberta. Um, we see tremendous potential to process right here. Uh, we, have, we have all the resources that we need. Obviously, supply is, is probably the most important consideration. Um, because we have the supply of, of pulses, um, we have affordable energy here, we have an abundance of water. As, um, as was alluded to earlier, you know, plant-based protein requires a tremendous amount of, of energy and water to, to facilitate it. And um, we have an abundance of that here in Alberta. We have um, the opportunity to, to take these pulses and, um, and, and rather than shipping, you know, for every, for every ton of isolate that you produce, and isolate is the ingredient that they use, for example, in the Beyond Meat Burger, um, for every ton of that, you need about five tons of, of, of peas. So instead of taking those peas, those five tons, and shipping them to Asia or the U.S. or Europe, and then having them um, formulate down a, a, into an ingredient and then reformulate into a finished food product, it would make more sense for us to develop that capacity here. We, we would, um, there's a lot that's transfer cost in, ver in terms of the supply. Um, in terms of our technology and our capabilities, uh, we have all the resources here in Alberta. So I just see tremendous potential in, in building the infrastructure here in Canada. It's the only thing we're lacking is the infrastructure. Right now, we, we can't do it. The market demand, I would say, probably exceeds capacity by a factor of 10 to 1 or, or more. And, it, and it's growing. The demand is growing. And we have virtually no capacity. So it's so encouraging to work with Ken and to work with Ava and to, to, to have this opportunity to bring together all these resources and build this capacity right here. So you're open to the partnerships to help build that capacity? Absolutely. I'm all about collaboration. I think the more we can collaborate, the more we can work together. Um, you know, there's, there's so much opportunity here. There is so much demand, and there is so much opportunity. I just think that it's, uh, it, it would benefit us all tremendously to work together. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. And keep putting your questions into the chat. We'll be sure to get to those in a few seconds. Before we move on, I'd like to ask Manpreet to launch our second poll. We'd like to know what you would rank as the most important factor for the establishment of a fractionation facility. Reg access to raw materials such as crops and water, regulatory clarity and efficiency, taxation regime, energy prices, local research capacity and expertise, access to skilled labor, transportation and logistics assets, or access to market? I'm going to give you a few seconds to put in your answers. OK. Come on, Preet. Can you close the poll, please? OK, looks like access to raw materials. Access followed to raw by, materials. Yeah, followed by access to market. Access to market, excellent. OK. so. Are you surprised by the results of this poll? Carlo, let's start with you. Uh, now, if you're a business, yeah, <laughs> access to materials are obviously up there. I'm surprised that infrastructure didn't come in a bit higher. Yeah. Uh, being able to not just move stuff in, but move it out. Yeah. I guess implied access to market may be in there, but yeah. Not always a safe assumption. No, no, no not always. Not always, for sure. For sure. OK. So I'm going to take a few questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to take a few questions from the audience. Uh, Paul in Des Moines, United States, asked, is there enough supply and processing 
to meet industry demand. Well, I think that uh, when it came to uh, processing capacity, I think that uh, Brad just mentioned that in, in the end of his answer, that there is probably not enough processing capacity locally. Let's, let's just kind of focus more on the, uh, on the supply. So as a region, what do you think? Do you think we have adequate supply? Absolutely. Like not only in terms of pulses, but we also have adequate resources here. So we've got the other, you know, our technology is all patented um, and it's all highly specialized. And so we have to manu we have to have that custom manufactured. Here in Alberta, we have a lot of um, a lot of engineers. We have a lot of capacity in terms of building infrastructure. A lot of that has maybe it's being reprovisioned from from the oil and gas sector. But I see tremendous opportunity in manufacturing here. Um, we have a lot of food manufacturing capacity here. You know, Alberta is a great place to manufacture for a number of reasons. It's, it's uh, typically a relatively cost-effective place to live. Uh, labor is relatively afford affordable here. We have great access to markets. And so a lot of food manufacturing companies will set up in Alberta and maybe sell five or ten percent of what they produce here in Canada. The rest of the product is, is exported to the, either the American market or to Asia. Um, and so in terms of overall capacity, we, we have a lot of the ancillary parts of it, but we just don't have the actual pure plant-based protein ingredient production capacity. At for least sure. not at, at the scale we need it at. Right. For sure Canada is an export nation by nature, so uh, we, have, we have the infrastructure to get materials out, um, and what we, what we really see is a need to do more with the materials we have locally. Right. Okay. Anybody yeah, else have I a just comment? want to include one more point, uh, um, Perry, uh, that, uh, you know, in terms of pulse fractionation, uh, say, the main, mainstream pulse we grow here is peas, but we grow lentils, uh, faba bean, uh, and chickpea, and we have this variety. And also we have the irrigated lands in the southern part of Alberta versus uh, rain-fed land, you see. So we have the capacity to include more varieties of pulses from different parts of the world. The research is going on, so that is one of the strengths here. We have the variety of pulses that can give you different functionalities to serve different markets. And speaking to some of the agricultural experts that I've been speaking to, um, the growing of pulses is good, uh, not only for the for our economy, but for the uh, for the farmland too. In fact, um, a lot of them think that more pulses should be grown so that there's a little bit more rotation happening. Uh, I know there's a lot of canola growers in right. in Western Canada um, that need to rotate from time to time to. Uh, decrease the uh, nitrogen depletion in the soils as well as uh, any uh, diseases that happen from from extensive use of one crop so um, the addition of pulses could you know help them economically but also help the uh, the soils That's right. yeah, we also have the ability to shift production and bring more production online not every not every area of the world has the ability to bring more land on the way we do mm -hmm. but if you look at peas say we have the ability to shift the crop from bulk export to China to doing more processing here. So there's several ways that we could bring more capacity very quickly online. We have great extension services, great seed and crop research that can get new varieties out to farmers and we have the ability to move quickly with market signals. Excellent. Anybody else? Okay. Um, this question is for Dr. Thava. Uh, was there any clinical study about the bioavailability of extracted proteins? The protein bioavailability uh, is always uh, research. There are tons of research done. You know, when you compare plant proteins and animal proteins, always the plant proteins show some lack of digestibility. Uh, but this uh, situation has improved a lot through research. And there are a lot of research outcomes and enzyme treatments and, and physical treatments to protein material that improves the digestibility somewhat closer to 
uh, the animal protein digestibility. So bioavailability, uh, definitely in the original material, although it is somewhat lacking compared to animal proteins, of course it's a superior protein, uh, but technologies are there and research has clearly demonstrated that we can bring the digestibility through simple processing towards the animal protein digestibility. So, yeah. um, Venkatesh asks, how can new startups benefit from idea to market development at the Leduc facility? How about I take that one? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that might be a good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, new startups can, can benefit from um, accessing the Luduc facility in terms of um, you have access to world-class scientists, uh, technologists, and a fully equipped pilot plant at a, at a very reasonable cost. We do charge for our services, um, but it, it's, about, it's about $500 a day and you can access all of that equipment. So where else could you, as a new startup, um, uh, where you could really um, have all that expertise and be able to start manufacturing very quickly without that upfront capital cost. So what it really does is it lowers your risks and increases your speed in terms of access to the marketplace. Excellent. Just before we go on to the next question, I just want to put in a, uh, a comment that was I intended to put in the beginning of the webinar. Uh, just to let you know, uh, we are following COVID uh, protocols here. Uh, as you can see, our, our speakers are spaced out uh, from each other so that there's uh, social distancing happening. Um, when they're off, off camera, they're all wearing their, uh, their masks. As you can see, some of them still have them in their hands. And, uh, <laughs> and we just wanted to let everybody know we're doing this in a safe and responsible way. Um, James is wondering, is there an opportunity just in peas or are there additional opportunities in canola, other grains and pulses for protein? Anyone? Right, uh, I'll take that question, uh, Perry. And uh, you know, every protein has its own functionality. It's all what the industry wants. Definitely, if you have a platform technology to extract these proteins, definitely we can, uh, we can extract and isolate any kind of protein from any plant material. But the, the functionality is different. So canola protein uh, functions in a different way from pea protein. Likewise, lentil versus faba bean, or you name it. So it's all uh, what the industry wants. You know, uh, currently uh, the the burger manufacturing they require this texturized protein, so they are focusing on this uh, soybean protein, which has a high quality. Uh, it can create a high quality texturized vegetable protein. But the research has clearly demonstrated that the pea can do the same thing. So we can texturize pea now, and the Beyond Meat Burger, uh, they, they are formulating this gluten-free, soy-free, you know, there are a lot of other attributes comes into play mm -hmm. when you are formulating a food product. So it's nice to have a platform technology uh, that will serve and extract proteins of different functionalities to supply to, the, to different industries. Yeah. And one of, the, uh, one of the comments in the Sprouted report was how Western Canada can become uh, dominant in the non-soy protein market. Um, there's been a lot of talk in media and stuff like that about uh, soy and uh, perceived negative effects of using excessive amounts of soy. Uh, so um, can I just put this one to, Car to you, Carlo, um, <laughs> regarding the... Uh, the, not, all, not all proteins are made the same as, as Tava just mentioned. Um, the advantages of m using multiple sources of, of pulses for, for, pro for pulse protein fractionation. Um, do you see any, any distinct benefits of moving in that direction? So I think I'll toss that one back to the doctor, but I will say that it, it's less about denigrating soy and more about touting the benefits of the wide variety of crops, as you mentioned. You're, you're one bad news story or one scientific discovery away from having the tables turned on you. Yeah. So it's always best to, I think, stick with the positives uh, with these. And it's the same thing with the competition between plant proteins and beef. You know, mm. We don't care here in Alberta what 
damn protein you eat. We just want to sell it to you. There are opportunities across the board in the growing demand for protein, and we don't care what you, what, what you choose. We just want to be able to supply it to you. So in that way, you have to think about the positive approach as opposed to the negative approach. Absolutely. <laughs> like JBS just, uh, this, just last year announced their um, non-meat protein uh, company, I think it's Plant. Plantable. I'm not, don't just, <laughs> I shouldn't have said it. Um, I'm not sure the name of the company, but um, their their philosophy is: we're not telling people what to eat; we're giving them options. And uh, essentially, to your point. Well, and another thing I would add, Perry, is that um, you know we have such strong fundamentals here in in Canada. I see it's going to be inevitable that we will develop an ecosystem here around plant-based protein. The, what we're seeing right now in terms of demand on plant-based protein is quite niche. It's, it's fairly expensive. It's focused on a few really big name products. But what we're, what we're hearing, the calls that we're receiving is, is for um, inquiries for a more diversified offering. So there's going to be room for soy. There's going to be room for pea. There's going to be room for a, just an explosion of new, new products. And so, you know, I think this also is, is going back to the original question about the variety of crops, um, I definitely think there's going to be demand for a variety of crops because there's going to be a demand for a variety of functionality. And I also think there's, you know, back to the, the, the point that was um, put to Ken about the development of these startups, I think we're going to see an explosion of this. We're already seeing it, um, you know, anecdotally, we're already seeing a lot of guys calling us and saying, well, can you support, can you get us, they can't get pea protein, they can't get any protein isolates or concentrates anywhere, so they're phoning us and they're saying, can we get it from you because we want to make this product or we want to make that product. So I just see, you know, just huge new growth and new value being created here. It's not about taking something away from somebody, it's just about adding some new, new value. Right. So just to let the audience know, if you hear some noise in the background, uh, we are in an operating facility here, so there are some alarms going off next door. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a question for Brad. What kind of capital are you looking for from a potential investor? From what type of investor? What, what type of capital are you looking for from a potential investor? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, right now, what we want to do is get into production, and that's our immediate concern. And so um, the level of investment that we, that we can bring in will basically affect the, the scale that we will establish in the short term or how quickly we will um, ultimately achieve our objectives. So in the short term, what we want to do is assemble a team and develop some capacity so we can actually get into sales and marketing of plant-based proteins. Um, beyond that, we're going to be expanding our sales very quickly, so we need to ramp that, that scale up. We're initially looking at building a pilot plant here and then incorporating our technology for the purpose of identifying how we can scale that up. Um, again, we're seeing interest at, at all levels. We're seeing a lot of interest internationally. A lot of big corporations, multinational corporations are interested in the technology because of its cost-saving benefit, um, which of course is a tremendous attraction for anybody looking at getting into this space. Um, but the the short answer to the question is that you know, we're quite flexible. Uh, we're just open to collaborating with the right group. If we get a, a straight on investor, that's fine. We'll work with that. If we get a strategic investor, um, that'll just, um, I guess, move us along a little quicker. Okay. Olu was asking, what is the potential market size? Oh boy, that's a softball. Okay, what's okay? What's the current market size? Let's look at this one. What so, is if you want the snapshot from a few years ago, uh, we've got information in the Sprouted report. You can project forward. But thinking about this, we've focused some attention on the rise of the global middle class. So you think about the population growing around the planet, but the percentage of that population that now has more money mm -hmm. that meets the global middle class uh, definition of consumers who can exercise choice. You take that growth and then add to it every form of protein. So if you want plant-based burgers, obviously fractionation plays a role. If you want fish, the ratio of pelagic, to, sorry, uh, fresh caught to farm fish is going to equalize. We now catch more fish freely than we farm, but by 2030, that's supposed to be equal. You're gonna need food for the fish. You can get that from plant-based proteins and ingredients. 
uh, animal feed, improved types of animal feed, you can also get from plant-based ingredients. So everywhere you see growth of demand for protein, you see opportunities for fractionation and ingredients. So the opportunities are boundless. Does anybody have an idea of the current size of the market or even the 2017 size? I have to go back and read it. <laughs> I, I've got a life. I have other things to do besides. <laughs> I think the report mentioned eight billion. Okay, sure, eight billion <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> but the projections are that it's going to be an exponential growth in the next few years. Sorry to put you on the spot like that. <laughs> Our last question comes from Kathy. For the purpose of crop, crop access, how do you define the region and what is responsible? Sorry, what is reasonable transport to processing facility? time and distance for a profitable business. So basically, what would be our Good. reasonable radius around the, the area for, pro, for, pro, for producing? You know, I own a flour mill. And the flour mill was originally built on the site where the current mill is back in 1926. It was built by two brothers from Toronto. They moved here and set up the mill um, about 45 minutes from where we're sitting right now in that location because of the fact that it was a tremendously, uh, or it was a great area to source their raw material, which at the time was red hard spring wheat. So since that time, we've sourced grains from Saskatchewan, from as far as Manitoba, um, obviously throughout Alberta. But central Canada, or, or central western Canada, is, is really um, the, the area that we draw from, I think, ideally. Okay. So. Just to add one more point to uh, say around the uh, Edmonton area, mm -hmm. we have tons of farmlands and the, the, the beauty I've seen is, uh, is integrated with the livestock industry as well. Mm -hmm. So when you're processing, say, pulses, say your focus is on protein, uh, protein is going to be in a pulse, it goes up to 30% of a pulse grain. The 70% of the remaining has to be marketed. The starch and fiber, uh, and these are the two major byproducts. So of course, we are, the research is going on uh, at, at an exponential scale to find value for these byproducts, the starch and fiber. Uh, but the initial market is there to the livestock industry. So if you are setting up a protein plant, uh, we can uh, immediately send, the, send the, the byproducts in a liquid form, at least, to, directly to the, to the livestock industry. If we did not get to your question, be assured we will be responding to all inquiries in the days to come. Keep an eye on your inbox. Before we wrap this web webinar, I would like to thank Ross Lowe and the staff here at the University of Alberta's Agri-Food Discovery Place. They have shared their facility and resources with us for this event, and we appreciate it. A big thank you to the production team at Bad Films. They have done an outstanding job of giving our webinar some extra polish. I also want to thank the panelists for such engaging and informative discussion. Carlo, Ken, Thava, Brad, thank you very much for your time and insight. And to those that have registered for this webinar, thank you for taking the time from your busy lives to learn more about the opportunity that it resides here in the Edmonton metropolitan region. Be good to each other. Goodbye.